my life was day to day boring Monday to yeah, then discover, yeah. hey, doing this stuff, if I work hard, I can actually achieve something. Like, what is this? It was so new to me mm. and I just got addicted to it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, next edition of the Kyle Reaver podcast. Um, you may notice that I'm in the same T-shirt and hat from the previous episode because I'm doing multiple recordings a day at the moment to really try and get a massive wad of episodes up so we can really get something happening. Uh, these podcasts are all about interviewing people that you would walk past on the street, especially with shoulders as big as the person that I have now that um, you would look at as just ordinary people, but they're doing extremely extraordinary things. And uh, as I said, um, there's a lot of famous people that you wouldn't know because we don't have to be massively famous to be doing stuff that we can all really admire. Um, I've known my guest for a number of years now. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many, probably 15, I reckon like 15 plus. Yeah, I met Helen, I think, when I was 18. So, yeah, 15, 15 plus years. Um, yeah. I always use this person as an example of what happens when you put your mind to something. She is probably one of the most um, disciplined people I know. And um, I always recount an argument that she had with me in a fitness class where she didn't want to do push-ups because it would make her chest too big. <laughs> And look where we are now. I actually also remember that. <laughs> Tammy Sarkozy, hello and welcome. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm pretty excited, especially because we do go way back. Way, and... way back. Hey. Way, way back. Way back. And I always see you as someone that kind of um really changed the trajectory of my life really thank you for that thank you yeah. for that that's, that's cool it's um yeah as we said we started chatting before we started recording and nearly did the whole podcast off air but um it's it's really been very interesting i guess to watch from afar what you have done and um what you continue to do. But uh, we'll get to that in the next 10 questions. So um, right. for those who are new to us, we have a series of 10 questions. Tammy got these questions a few days ago, so I'm sure she's done a little bit of deliberation. Yep, I went over them this morning. That was a tough <laughs> question, by the way. <laughs> um, and for those that um, are new to us as well, we work through these. Um, some can look like they're repeating each other, but they're not. And there is um, the episodes of tangents going off on. It will happen more likely than not tangent. because, yeah, it, it, it explores a little bit. And some of these questions for a lot of our guests have been um, quite thought provoking. But let's get into it. Question number one, birth to now in seven minutes. And by the way, Tammy, it's not seven minutes. The last we're averaging about thirty minutes for each of these for this one question. You can cut me off or tell me, hey, speed it up. <laughs> yeah, all right. Three, two, one, go. All right. So I'll start with my birth was my birth was far more traumatic than I could have ever anticipated in my life. I knew it would be hard, but I can, without being biased, say my birth was terrible. And I actually remember Helen telling me that her labour was 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. It was 32. So for those who, um, so Tammy's, so Billy is just, just on one. 
He's yeah, Good. eleven months now. So you've just recently had a child. So we're going to maybe work backwards a little bit. But tell me, yeah, Helen's label was thirty-two minutes, I think, um, for Lila. And it was literally a case of the obstetrician flicking his tie around the back and said, let's get this baby out for you, which by the sounds of it was not the case for you. No, no. My active labor went for, I think, 10 hours. Oh, um, Jesus. I was having contractions every two minutes. So for context there, I was talking to my sisters about it and they were in active labor, labor for 20 minutes. So that's like the mm. intense part. Um, and I had nerve pain shooting through my body every contraction. Um, it was awful. Like there was blood everywhere. I was throwing up. There was poo. There was like you can't avoid it. It happens. <laughs> and what happened was he had just got stuck. Mm. So there was a reason he wasn't coming out. His head was stuck on an angle. So we had to go through the dural, which I was like, I don't think I'm going to get the epidural. Then we, because of the epidural, the um, baby, I think they have to help like vacuum it out because you can't feel the yep. thing, which was a relief because yep. it was awful. Because you need, because they've got the vacuum, they need to do the episiotomy. And for those who don't know what an episiotomy is, it's basically some clean little cuts around the opening so that you don't tear from your vagina to your butt because that <laughs> would otherwise happen because the baby comes out so fast. So that's, I mean, it was, it was horrible. And I know people have amazing births. Like it sounds like Helen did, which is yeah. lovely. <laughs> but I mean, no part of, no part of it is fun, but um, with that in mind, now we'll go back onto what you do and where you've grown up and all the rest of it as we move backwards. Would you say the training that you have done in previous years leading up to that because um, you've had a heavy fitness background, CrossFit background, did that help? With the labour? Yeah. Or no. was it just shit? I think, <laughs> I think if his head wasn't stuck because that was just bad luck, I think, yeah, it would have. My um, Rating, rating of pain on a level of 1 to 10. Fucking 12. 12. <laughs> 12. I've never felt anything like it in my life. They got a point like I was almost convulsing, like I was shaking and I couldn't stand up anymore. Um, it was just so I couldn't sit down, I couldn't stand, I couldn't lie down because everything would just provoke that nerve pain. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've had sciatica before, but it's that kind yeah. of thing. Um, it was awful. But I I can definitely confirm that all the training I had done in the lead up and, you know, my lifetime helped me with recovery immensely. Like I was back moving in three weeks. Yeah. So let's, let's go back to that. So, um, you know, let's, let's start it. Let's start at the beginning. Let's start at your birth. Where did it, where did it all come together for Tammy? For exercise. No, just you. Where were you born? School? The whole, the whole lot. Let's go right from the beginning. Oh gosh! So you want me to start right from the beginning? My life's really boring. Yeah. It's so boring. No, you're not. I had a lovely upbringing. Where were you born? Where, I was born yeah. in Mildura, in Victoria. Okay. Um, yeah. And my mum was a single mum for quite a while, so she did you know, some hard work to bring me up while I was little. We eventually moved to Maryborough, which I think you might be from. Yeah. I didn't right? know you lived in Maryborough. Oh, Maryborough, Victoria. Yeah, I lived in Maryborough oh. for maybe two or three oh, years I lived in, with my mum and my grandpa. I lived in Maryborough, Queensland, mate. Yeah. There's so a Maryborough. I, oh, did you? Queensland? Yeah. Yeah, right. Keep going. See, this yeah. is what I'm loving like, about these podcasts. I'm, I'm learning so much this about would have been people. Many, I, I knew that you came from Maryborough. I, I'm sure mm -hmm. we have had that conversation, but that would have only been maybe three years, maybe 1987, 1990. Okay. So I was still living in Maryborough. How old were you then? 
like three, <laughs> like three or four years old. So, but my grandpa Mary... was a pastor at a church in Maryborough. So, Maryborough, like we are talking Maryborough, Queensland, near Harvey Bay. Yeah, near Harvey Bay. Yeah. I would have been in grade seven to grade 10. I was going to, um, I went to Aldridge State High School for two years and then 1990 Aubrey. I switched. Aldridge, Aldridge, the one up um, oh. the one up the top. And then I went to Merriba yeah. High. So yeah, there is a very high probability that my mother would possibly know if your grandparents were there. There's a very high probability she would know them. Because my mother knows everybody so, yeah, in my that town. was a pastor at a church in Maryborough. He lived there forever. Oh, okay, we're going to have to have this chat offline because I am sure. Yeah, he would. He would know. He would know. What did you think of Maryborough? Um, you know, while I lived there for those few years, I loved it because I got to live with my mum. My my grandpa was like the best human on the planet. But I was three, four, mm. five years old, so everything's great then. <laughs> Okay. And what happened then? Where did, where, where did you go from there? Um, so then we moved to Toowoomba after that. Uh, my mum remarried, had, you know, that combined. So I've got like a, a blended family that combined a stepbrother and then I've got two half sisters. Um, we lived in Toowoomba for, I would have moved to Brisbane from Toowoomba in 2002 as soon as I graduated because I was like, just get me out of here. I need my own life. Like my, my yep. upbringing was nice. Um, you know, there were issues, as everyone does, but it, I've got nothing to complain about. But I will say the most grateful thing, one of the most grateful things I have is that my mum was so health conscious. Like everything we ate was healthy. And I mean like, you know, everything was whole grain. Everything was organic. It wasn't just, oh, yeah, eat some fruit and vegetables. She was gluten and lactose intolerant, so we had no choice. And I remember at the time, I'm like, I just want some white bread with some sprinkles on top or I just want some cordial, you know. Um, and I have to give her so much credit for the health that I have now. Like what she did shaped my mindset, which contributes to how I can manage my food, but the health, the, the actual health that I have. So I guess you could summarise that, like, so you are extremely health conscious you are extremely healthy. That's not a big deal to you. Like some people really like push themselves to begin to be as healthy as you. That for you is, it's a habit. It's like you look at other people and go, well, this it's is just, this is normal for me. It's so normal for me. I get pissed when it's, when I, when I don't treat my body with that respect because I can, my body is extremely responsive when I don't give it the food that it needs or yep. go out for a walk first thing in the morning. I can 100% tell and feel the difference. Mm. What, um, so work-wise, before you found, I guess you'd call it uh, your calling, what were you doing before you switched into what you do now? I was an office bitch. <laughs> I had no purpose in my life at all and it made me fucking miserable. Well, one good thing that came of it. When I worked with Helen and I was going to say, that's one good thing that came. We wouldn't have met if you weren't an office bitch. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it was. Everything aligns in that that path, right? Yeah, Yeah, it does. Um, Now... We're going to shoot forward because this is the real thing I want to talk to you about. You are already health conscious. You are healthy. But then you start doing a little bit of exercise. And as I said, we had this, I wouldn't go so far to call it an argument. It was an avid discussion about you not wanting to do push-ups because you want your chest is going to get too big. But now what blossomed from there so you went in and this this healthy stuff this exercise i like this i want to do this so take us through your exercise journey well it definitely that was my fork in the road like i was really active in school i played volleyball i played tennis i always did 
um, basically any sport that I could, any opportunity I could. So I always loved it. But then there was a huge gap between school and, say, what's that, like 17 to maybe 26 or 27 years old. I think that was a phase of, woohoo, I'm free. I'm going to mm. drink, I'm going to party, I'm just going to whatever. I've got $30 for groceries this week, I'm going to eat pasta and cheese. But when it, it started when my boss dared me to do a 10K run, which is why I, this is how we then got involved, right? I, I don't know yeah. if you remember that. He didn't look fit at all and I kind of laughed in his face when he was saying it was just the bridge to Brisbane, hanging around the 10K bridge to Brisbane and I was like, <laughs> what are you saying? Like, oh, I could beat you in that. This is me who hadn't done exercise since high school, maybe seven years prior. And he just looked at me and he's like, well, then why don't you do it? And I was like, okay, fine. And I went home and I Googled how to run 10Ks because I'd never <laughs> done anything past cross country at school. Yeah. And then somehow you got involved there and you're like, hey, why don't you do these, you know, CrossFit style classes that I run? It will help you with, with the 10K run. And I was like, yeah, really? Because, you know, I had no idea. Mm. So I went along and I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of like this stuff. This is cool. And I yeah. think what I loved about it most was the you are addicted to the physical changes that happen, as in like, oh, I just, you know, ran 200 metres in 90 seconds and then the next week, 80 seconds, a week after, whatever, you're just progressing and it's addictive and it's like this switch in your brain flicks. And, you know, this is someone, me, who had no purpose in what I was doing in my job. I hated my job. My life was day-to-day, boring Monday to yeah, then discover, yeah. hey, doing this stuff, if I work hard, I can actually achieve something. Like, what is this? It was so new to me mm. and I just got addicted to it. So what did that addiction start to lead to after that? Where did you go from there? Well, you then asked me to run the classes and I was like, What? Do you remember that? You asked me to run the classes. Yeah. So I started to run the classes as well as get involved in them. And I remember that first class, no one wanted to listen to me. <laughs> it was like, what does she know? Um, but eventually, you know, they came to. But then I started running um, boot camps in the park for my friends. And yep. then the Brisbane Valley Hockey Club saw that because we'd run it in the Woolwind Park near the Valley Hockey Club. And they were like, hey, do you want to run for the Brisbane Valley hockey team? And I was like, okay. And then I was like, you know what, I could probably do something with this. I like this coaching stuff. So then I did my course um, and started actually doing it as a job, just part-time, while I still did my amazing, horrible, full-time admin job. (laughs) (laughs) And from there, it really bit. And so what, what came first, the, the formal CrossFit or did the bodybuilding fitness stuff come first or were they both working no, together? No, CrossFit stuff. It's like it's ingrained in me. I just, every time you do that kind of session, you feel a sense of satisfaction either because you did better than you thought, mm. you did stuff that you thought that was hard and you did something to feel alive. Like body, so the, bodybuilding definitely came next because your training, I don't know if you remember this, but in three months, my whole body changed. It was nuts. You did. You, um, I well, always say to Helen. Like you said, I wouldn't speak. I know. Well, I've always said to Helen, you, you just, I mean, again, you would hear that comment where people will say, oh, they're just blessed with good genetics. Um you definitely had something genetically that your body just literally, you know, you three months later, it looked like you'd just been stung like a bee. Like it it just seemed to, for for whatever it was, it just bang. Like it just, it really, your body just responded so quickly. Yeah, it was nuts. (laughs) And it was, when was it? I started getting comments from people like, but it, they were funny comments. So I'd started working at a gym, coaching, you know, doing PT, and some of the trainers, I remember one trainer said to me, why don't you do a fit body competition? And I'm like, what is that? And she meant mm. bodybuilding, right? Because yeah. in 2010, this is when that was, 
no one knew what bodybuilding was except you know your stereotypical staunch on gear bodybuilders yep. outside of that it yep. was so untapped and people just kept saying hey why don't you do a show why don't you do a show and i'm like what is this and then i went to do you know vinny 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 no not off the top of my head no he's um he's been involved in the bodybuilding industry a long time and he owned a supplement store and like at carindale there was a supplement and gym equipment store and i went in there one day and he pulls me aside and he's like you need to do a competition and i was like okay you know what everyone's saying this to me i don't even know what you're talking about and he's like you need to contact this person and get started because i don't know he just he was like you've got to go do this and i so i contacted mm. this person which was a posing coach and then it just sort of fell into place from there it just kind of happened and yeah. um i was the tiniest oh my gosh i think i went on stage at like 46 kilos God, that's what do you, what do you walk around at now? Sixty, and my God. last stage weight was fifty five. Far out. That's a huge <laughs> yeah. cut. <laughs> yeah, but I was tiny, so tiny. Obviously, you've put on a lot more muscle since that first show. Yeah. After that but, first show, I was like, I never want to do this again. Like, because <laughs> it was hard. It was obviously very, very hard. And I was like, no, nah, don't want to do it again. And then after, I think I then got my boobs done. So I had implants done about a month yeah. after. I had three months off. No, three, six weeks off. And my body just shrunk back to this tiny little skinny tummy. And I was like, I hate this. <laughs> this is shit. <laughs> and so I started training again. I'm like, I'm going to do another show. I, I just, I guess it made me feel special or unique or something. Yeah. But a big shift in my muscle density happened over that time. Like I went from a little muscle person to like some serious density. It was, it was crazy. Okay. It's, um, and then from there, Competition wise, where did it where did it lead? Where did where did where did the um I wouldn't say the pinnacle because I'm sure there's still stuff for you to do, but where did you end up with it? Um, I ended up competing for the Miss Figure Universe title in Miami, in America, and I won that title, which I like. That is still one of my pinnacles, definitely. Did you um so I'm pretty happy I took that one off. Fucking nice. Did you yeah. uh did you go over there and I mean you're a very um you know, you're a very humble person, but did you go over there thinking you even had a chance? Or did you go over no, you know, like, I remember And when they called your like, name, did you go, What the fuck? <laughs> no. I that was two thousand and sixteen. Yeah. And I remember trying to research like who is competing at this show? But Instagram and all that stuff was still kind of in, still you just couldn't together. find info like you can now. Yeah. I was like, I don't even know if there's anyone doing this show. And like there was about 30, 20, maybe 20 people in my division from all over the world. It was epic. But I was shitting myself. Like <laughs> I remember every night I'd have a shower and I'd have to talk myself down with nerves, like really get in a, clear headspace to sort of shun those nerves out because it was almost debilitating. And I guess you've also, in all that, like you just said earlier, the stigma is attached with this industry. Is that something that you're always just fighting, like and probably still to this day, like just the stigma is attached with it. Like if you're a big girl walking around with big arms, suddenly there's those stigmas attached. It, it's just, you know, I mean, you would be a person that by now you would just would not give a fuck. But no, was there a time where you just were worried? No. I used to. I remember when I was doing my first competition, I – I vividly remember the looks I would get from people and it wasn't a nice look. It was 
a look of up and down and like almost disgust. Yeah. And there would always yeah. be old people. Yeah. Um, and that, in a way, it kind of drove me hard. I was like, I don't know, there's something about people disapproving of what you're doing where you're like, I'll mm. show you, like, your disgust or your lack of faith in what I can do only pushes me up. But I think it's it's, an- it's changed now. Like, the stereotype now, <laughs> go look on Instagram. The Fitzbo, yeah. now it's just a bunch of, honestly, sometimes I'm ashamed to be associated with the slut fest that is Instagram, that is associated with fitness. Well. That's another topic to, I guess, discuss because you, what have you got to, what would you, I don't know if you call it devil's advocate or like you're involved in an industry sometimes that for want of a better word has a horrible stigma attached. And like you said, sometimes you just go, fuck, no wonder they think we're idiots or no wonder we get all these comments because yeah, the Instagram world does nothing to uh, alleviate those thoughts, does it? And like we spoke earlier about your client base, do you find that that drives you to have a different client base now? Like you don't want those clients. You want people who are very yeah. personally vested in their health I and wellness. Support. Yeah, well, I, I don't know why people don't like that sort of um, provocative nature is even associated with fitness. I just think, there's always that sort of person that needs their um, – they need validation from attention, right? And it just so happens that fitness is quite a big trend now and you can wear minimal clothing and I think they mask what they really want by, hey, I'm fitness, but really I'm going to yeah. bend over and show you my cooch. But <laughs> I – There's, there's plenty know, of that. That's what the clientele <laughs> hey? No. I said there's plenty of that, you know, as I always oh, joke. There's, and- there's so much. With with teenage, but if it wasn't with teenage fitness girl, they were using it would be something else, right? Well, yeah. I mean, that with my teenage, that person, hundred percent. With my teenage girls now buying swimwear, I always joke and go, "Oh, all these girls on the beach, they keep putting them on backwards." But um, that's that's what it is now, isn't it? Like you know, it and is, again, but you know, I pride myself in not being that, and. Because while I don't get anything out of that, I, I always just think, what if my mum sees this? Yeah. Trying, like, what if she does? I feel so ashamed. I, I want to be a coach that leads people, that inspires people, that has real information. Like, I don't give a fuck. Honestly, I don't give that much fucks about how I, how I physically look. Yeah. I want to be someone that gives value, that inspires. And that's given me a very, very, very good, solid, wholesome content. And I guess the two things there is it's more how we feel as to how we look and yeah. your, your focus is the big picture because we can clearly say that those people on Instagram and, you know, the people that aren't like yourself, but they put these pictures up, but inside they just feel horrible. They so you're trying to go to that big picture. Would you do it? And yep. To mask it and hey, I'm preaching self love. I don't know if anyone else sees through that. You would, I do. Yeah. But it just, yeah. 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 I mean, I don't find that inspiring. So but. lead forward. So lead forward to now. Yeah. What does Tammy do now? Are you? Well, oh, here's here's the big announcement. Would you call yourself retired from competition? There is this tiny little thing in my head that says one more. But mm-hmm. I don't know because having a baby has put very much of a two year pause on progression, if not regression, like muscle yeah. to build muscles, hard work. Um, yeah. I'm not where I was in terms of muscle mass. I don't know if I've even got the time to be able to get back what I had, but. It's that whole unfinished business. Like um, with my last show, I got awarded a, a pro card. Uh, that was my – I had a pro card with a different federation, but this one is, I guess, of a higher calibre. I haven't done the show with the other pros. 
So there's this unfinished business that's nagging at my head, but until I can get what I had back, it's it's off in the distance somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But now your role, you're a online coach, um, so nutrition. You do posing work, um, exercise, physio exercise setting. Is that now being very rewarding? Like you said, you've got these, your clientele since you've moved to Townsville has actually gotten older. Is that now nice to have these people that like, you, like we keep saying they are genuinely interested in their overall health and wellness as opposed to looking good for the gram? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And like I said, a lot of them are career women where they have come to a point in their life that they've realised if I don't, ex- like if I don't find a way in my 50, 60 hour week to eat well and to move, I'm going to be very sick. Like they have come to a point where they're high stressed, high anxiety, they're seeing the repercussions of poor health, they're not sleeping well. Um, they're trying their hardest, but it's it's just a mess. Like they really just need someone to say, hey, let me do the thinking for you. You're too busy for this. X, Y, Z. Do yeah. these things. Let's work it in with your lifestyle. And it's just so rewarding because they're hardworking. Like these women are hardworking women. They just, their mind is so hectic from work. They can't, they just can't manage the outside stuff. So helping them with that and, you know, within a week, oh, my gosh, I feel so <laughs> much better. And you know what? The, the body naturally comes with that. They've yeah. improved their health. They're moving better. They're sleeping better. Oh, my gosh, I lost two kilos. Oh, my gosh, I squat a 100-kilo back squat. Like yeah. it's that to me is just so rewarding. And you would see this all – all too often people doing it all around the other way. I'm going to go to the gym six, seven times a week, uh, eat shit, hardly sleep, and nothing's happening. What's going wrong? So I need to go to the gym more and I'll keep eating shit and doing that. Yeah. You know what? I just, you know what it's like? You preach the same stuff constantly and everyone's like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And you're like, but you don't know because you're not doing it. You're doing it backwards, like you said. Mm. Yeah. We were talking earlier about kids. So just jumping forward on a tangent, when Billy starts saying, I know, when you're telling them to do stuff, yeah, just you wait. If you knew, why aren't you I'm doing sure. it? I feel like he's already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you see what I mean? That was 33 minutes. So I told you, Holy seven minutes shit. is non-existent. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's go quick. I think we got past the labour. We sidetracked from there. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded too painful. Like was, I'm sure you've got PTSD from that labour. You know what? I do. I I really do think I got the short straw in the labor, but you know, I had an I had a seamless pregnancy. <laughs> the only thing that made me pregnant was the fact there was a human there. There was no I had no, nothing else to complain about. Um so I guess the concept of having a second child is not on the books and it's <laughs> we are done. We are done. I think I think I'd break down with anxiety knowing I had to go through birth again. I just, no. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, No. All right. Three reasons you get out of bed every morning. So I really, you know, I've really thought about this and I'm such a literal person. Like when you ask me questions, my answers are so boring and literal. It's literally like... (laughs) It's definitely, I like Billy is my world. I just when I get up, I'm like, I love going into his room in the morning and seeing him there perched up in his little cot. I just mm. like it makes my day. Other than that, it's literally just to be alive. Like, hey, I'm here. I'm living. This is it. Like, mm. I've got a you know 
pretty happy person. I like my life and I don't really have a huge motivator other than that. Do you like, we'll probably get into these questions after, but that change to do what you're doing now, there's never a time where you go like, cause you said you've, you've in the past, you've done some big hours and now with Billy, you're having to play Tetris with your hours. Is there ever a time where you do just go, this is really fucking hard, but then you pull yourself back because of what you used to do? Every day. <laughs> there is, you, you would know this, right? When you have this little human, they need 110% attention because the moment you mm -hmm. even try to <laughs> check an email check your work phone or something, they're like, oi, they'll hurt themselves, they'll start demanding something. It's like they've got this sixth sense. And if you try and do the work and the baby or the kid at the same time, it is sheer frustration. Like it is, <laughs> it is, it is not a nice feeling. And so I've had to really reinforce you only do one or the other. You cannot cross those paths like when he's yeah. with you so i work from home and he's at home he's not daycare he's with me mm. when it's his time it's his time when yeah. he's asleep i work when chris comes home 3 4 p.m i'll then work till six i can't cross the lines otherwise it's shit yeah yeah and it sounds like you um again because you are so disciplined it seems to be working and then, yeah, uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm an all or nothing person, but yeah, having that discipline definitely shines through looking after a baby. Like I can switch off the other stuff because in my head, I don't have a choice. I can I yeah. sit here and I tried once, took me 25 <laughs> minutes to write a three minute email. <laughs> and I was yep. like, what was the point? Like, why did why I am I even like, bothering? Why? Yeah, yeah, just to feel frustrated. And this baby who's like deserves your attention, you know, why? Yeah, so I've just put my foot down there and I do yeah, think discipline plays part yeah. in that. 100%. Question three, two guilty pleasures that you have. Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shit. Oh, shit. Socks off. So <laughs> my number one guilty pleasure <laughs> is designer handbags. Okay. Okay. And the reason, like, I'm not a fashionable person. I was going to say, from a woman who lives in a crop top, I don't know where you would use them that much. Especially in Townsville. Like, <laughs> in I'm Townsville, you'd have to lock them up. Very good in Townsville. <laughs> so, I had this really business savvy client when I worked in Brisbane when I was a PT. And, like, she was amazing. She was like, you know, we are here to make money. You don't work to not make money, you know? And she would give me all this advice to help with my business. She was amazing. And she said to me, when you reach your first milestone, and we'll figure this out together, you have to celebrate with something. She's like, what would just be so out of reach and so obnoxious? What would it be? And I was like, probably like a handbag. She's like, all right, then let's do it. And I, you know what? I love my hand. When I wear it, I'm like, mm -hmm. like, I feel like I, they remind me that my work has a result. It's not just work, work. Like there is, yep. you know, hey, I achieved this milestone and this is the extreme thing I celebrated with. So yep. every milestone I hit, I go and do something like that. Very good. That's good. I think it's good to have something, you know, something tangible that you can reward yourself with. You know, people will go on a trip. Some people will go out to dinner. You buy a handbag. It's all, it's all relative. It's all relative. What's your favorite one? Your favorite handbag? <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> They all have oh. a different purpose. Okay. I've got <laughs> – okay, I, would, I don't know. I love them all, but I have this one. <laughs> this this cute little 
Gucci bum bag. Okay. 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 I purposely bought it because I was like, I'm about to have a baby. I'm going to walk my dog. I'll put the poop bags in the little Gucci bum bag. Oh, my God. And I never did. I've never put a dog poop bag in at once. But anyway, that's why I bought that. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a cute story with it. Every time I look at that, I'm like, what an idiot. <laughs> you, um, I'm learning more about you than I have learned in the last 10 years. This is great. <laughs> uh, I'm even pondering the question. <laughs> yes, I'll understand. Helen would understand. Is there yeah. a number two? Oh, yeah. So I did really think about this, and it's buying baby clothes. I can't stop. They're just, they're just so cute, and I know he's going to grow out of them in a couple of weeks. But I can't, I just can't stop. I saw a, um, I saw a reel. I think you put up of a very cool looking baby, uh, baby camp chair, high chair, even the other day. So there's, there's, there's accessories even. Well, no, no. So one of my <laughs> friends, or an old client of mine, has started up a baby accessory business. And, you know, in exchange for me saying, hey, my baby's got this, she gives it to me for free. So I have, <laughs> yeah, it's epic. So this $120 little hiking chair that he's got was a gift. Do you, um, this is something that I have like essentially, you know, the greater portion of my life, my mum's been a single mum. Is there, do you think sometimes without getting too, back in the basement is that sometimes a thing to try and give the things that you didn't have to billy yeah um in a childhood yes so if there was one thing i could change about my childhood it was to i, I mean i think to tell your kid you love them every day to me is a big deal. And it's not yeah. that I was not loved, but it's just something I want to do for him. Um, and I've stuck to that since day one, which is it's not hard. <laughs> but mm. I think the other thing, I never want to expose him to arguments. And I know it's natural to, to you know, be around that, but, you know, some of the stuff that I – went through growing up in a step family with some pretty hectic arguments with my parents. I remember how much that used to stress me out as a kid and how yeah. upset it made me. And I yeah. think that's part of why I am how I am now. Like I can just go tunnel vision, right? Like I don't need the support of people to get me where I want to go. And I think it's because of that kind of upbringing. Like, like I said before, it was never a horrible upbringing. But for Billy, like, it's just something I never want, you know, take it somewhere else. Yeah. Be the most yeah. loving parents you can. In terms of stuff, nah. There's, yeah. There's nothing <laughs> I felt I missed out on that he needs. Yeah, cool. It's, um, yeah, it's like you just try to, even by doing that, like you said, with the arguments, you're trying to fix up what maybe, and again, I'm sure you your parents didn't think at the time they were doing any wrong, anything wrong, but you just went, I won't do that. Yeah, because how it made me feel, it's definitely stood out to me um, and I don't ever want him to feel that like his. I don't know if any kid should really. Yeah. Okay. Question, uh, question four. One thing that you bought that has literally made you happy every day after and it can't be a handbag. My air fryer. I fucking oh my love God. it. <laughs> I was so late to the party with my air fryer. We don't, okay, we don't own one. We don't own You're one. Missing we out. Probably, okay. <laughs> this is, do you know what? There's so many things that we're talking about at the moment because I haven't spoken to you since Billy was born, I think. I feel like I'm talking to a different person. You've gone, <laughs> these are just such mum conversations, you know, so yeah, this is great. 
You know what? This is true. But you don't have a hair dryer, so you don't understand, right? I bought it three months ago, and I've used it every single day. And every time I put something new in it, I'm like, holy shit. Like, why do I not know about this? So, so you being so conscious of food, you don't eat out or do takeaway too much at all. So, do you cook at um, home a lot? No, not a. I I don't love takeaway. Like, I can tell you, the last time I had McDonald's was. Uh, I just got a tattoo done. Kate Muckett was driving me back. <laughs> from Toowoomba to Brisbane. This is how long ago that was. That would have been maybe 2015, maybe 2012, last time I had McDonald's. I just don't love Oh, but I do have a Macca's coffee. But in terms of takeaway, it just makes me feel like, it just makes me feel shit. I don't get off on it, but I do like a good restaurant dinner. I will say that. So go to meal in the air fryer. Go to meal in the air fryer. Uh, it would be salmon. Ooh. So crispy skin salmon, potato chips, and I've only just discovered broccoli <laughs> or Brussels sprouts with parmesan cheese, and they go really oh. crispy. It's pretty. Helen's way ahead of you with that. Helen's way ahead of you on that. We've we've been well, doing we've been doing that for some fryer. time, <laughs> but not in the air fryer. We have this old thing; it's Why? called an oven. <laughs> we are we are backward. We have this thing called an oven. <laughs> well, look, I only got mine three months ago. Everyone else has been doing this for years, so you're not too far behind. <laughs> these are oh, these are great conversations. This is good. Okay, <laughs> now. Here we go. Number five. One thing everyone thought you were crazy doing, but did it anyway, and it paid off. Okay. So I would definitely say becoming involved in the fitness industry. Um, I remember so many people saying, why would you want to do that? There's no money in it. And you know, we've reached the peak of fitness. Why would you do this? And, again, this would have been back in maybe 2011 or something like that. Fast forward 2024, look at fitness now. It is out of control. It is just going up, 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 up. Um, And I've built a career from it. Like to go from part-time PT in starting in 2010 or at, you know, with with you back at um, the CrossFit style training, to now, like, it's the best decision I made, hey. What would you say, so like we've spoken about the changing face of the fitness industry, what would you say the two biggest changes that you have seen in the fitness industry since you started to now? Two biggest changes. Um. I would definitely say the acceptance of females being muscular. And I noticed that as CrossFit became more popular. So I remember I used to do powerlifting for a few years and there was very few girls that did it. And to give context on that, after a powerlifting meet I did, I was ranked like sixth in Australia and I wasn't that great. (laughs) Like um, I the numbers I did then versus girls now, it was like their warm up, right? But that's just to show not many girls did it. And I noticed over the years as CrossFit became more popular, you know, there was weightlifting, you know, your Olympic lifting, cleans, jerks, snatches, then the heavy lifting that came with it, you know, yeah. back squats, front squats, deadlifts, and the physical changes that came with that as CrossFit got more popular. And people started to notice, you know, the top CrossFit athletes, females, they're muscular. I think it encouraged girls to, you know, be more active like that, lift heavy stuff. And the more you see it, the more accepted it becomes. So I really think that opened up the doorway of normality of girls having muscles. It It was awesome. It works for me. Now I'm normal, not like a freak walking down the street. Well, that's it. 
What's the second thing? The second thing, uh, social media, definitely. So social media in a way has been good because without it, I wouldn't have my online job. Like it no. is the source of my clients. What platform, what platform gives you the most exposure? Instagram, Instagram, Facebook? Definitely. Yeah. It's funny because when I messaged you, I initially messaged you on Messenger and it went a couple yeah, of days. Yeah, I saw it a few weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> and then I messaged you on Instagram and I think you answered within 20 minutes. Yeah, so probably. clearly that's, I, that's what's more in the front of your mind. Is that how you contacted I more? I barely use Facebook. I use it for um, certain things with clients, but they're in a group. Yeah. But if that group's not active, I don't go on it because people hassle me. I think the one downfall, a major downfall of being an online coach is there are many portals of contact. Yeah, and 100%. sometimes checking that stuff gives me a bit of anxiety because I'm like, who wants something at like 9 p.m. at night? So I kind of don't yep. check it. <laughs> but if you, you'd be like this business, if social media didn't exist, how would you, how would you gather business? How would you do anything? Well, I definitely wouldn't have an online job. Like I would not be here in Townsville with a job. But I was lucky. So Chris got stationed in Townsville two or so years ago and I had started my online business. I, I wrapped up PT in October. We moved here in November and I was 100% online. I would not, if there was no social media, I would not be here right now doing this. Was that... um? When you made that initial move, were you um were you wondering how that would go? So you don't do any PT face to face in Townsville anymore. You're just all online. Is that all a bit online. cool? Now, not not to say PTs have a you know, but sometimes doing those PTs, as you'd know, day in day out, that can get a bit hard on the brain. Do you enjoy just it's, doing the online stuff more? The the hours with PT are rough because it's early morning and late evenings. And yep. I do love face-to-face -face interaction, but you would know this, right? When when you are with your members or your clients, you know, while this might be an everyday thing for you, this is their like once a week, twice a week thing that they love and they yep. deserve the best of you. And it's really hard to stay switched on that much with every single client back to back. 100%. And if there's shit going on in your life, you can't bring it in. Like, it's not their problem. Don't let them, you know, it's, mm. I'm here with you. Mm. I'm here with you. I'm giving you my best. You are the number one priority right now, or you group of people are the number one priority right now, which is what they pay for. It's what they deserve. Um, I definitely think after 10 years of PT, I had, reached that point where I knew I needed to do something else because I could feel myself losing the enthusiasm and I always knew I can't can't do this job well if I get to that point. And yeah. I, I have too much pride in what I do to ever let that happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um I think that's a good turning point for you because like there's probably more you could do with more people online than there is doing pts isn't there i can, can give people everything now I, you, you know i love it and i can manage my hours to suit a baby can you imagine having a baby to <laughs> look after working from six till ten in the morning and then four till seven at night like it that would be impossible it's not you just not can't. Possible. can't you just can't so it was another one of those things that sort of just evolved that way and led me to here now that's good. It seems like, yeah, I, I got to admit when you said you were moving to Townsville, I didn't think you would fail. I don't think that's an option, but I do. I did wonder in my head, I wonder how this will go. I wonder how this will, oh, this will, this I definitely will affect me. Wondered that. I was scared. You would because be. Because I suppose in Brisbane, I was someone like, and I could make face with people, you know, people yeah. talk, a lot of word of mouth is where you get clients from face Absolutely. to face. But Absolutely. here in Townsville, I'm literally invisible here except on social media. Mm. Is that except now going to CrossFit, I make face and I do get you know clients through there. 
is that um is that sometimes a little bit refreshing to have those to be back to being a bit of a ghost well oh, we have it in this area like we can't walk around here a lot with people knowing who we are was it nice to go into a coffee shop and no one want to talk to you for 20 minutes that you could just order a coffee sit down and no one fucking bothers you. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. In Brisbane, I couldn't go anywhere without bumping into people. And it used to make me a little bit anxious because sometimes I'd have five minutes, five minutes. I just need yep. to go get some bread. And then yep. you bump into someone and you're like, I don't know how to not be rude right now. You know, I've got five minutes. And then you'd be there 30 minutes. And you're like, the rest of my day is out of whack. But Townsville, small Kyle, like, now I still go places and I still, it, it still happens. It's yeah. fine. And you'll, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll grow. It'll grow. All right. Six, number, question number six. Four things you cannot live without, animate or inanimate. Okay. So I wrote these down because I really, really, really had to think about this. And again, <laughs> I'm a very literal person, so these <laughs> questions are pretty boring. I definitely say exercise, okay, whether it's go for a walk in the morning, which for me is a non-negotiable. It starts my day just in a really positive, clear space. So you Especially roll out of – uh, work from home. So you roll out of bed, um, put Billy in when, uh, whatever he goes in, and then you just go for a wander? Yep, take the dog, take Billy. There is no cafes where I live in this part of Townsville. But, well, there's one, but uh, so we go to McDonald's every day. <laughs> we travel over to McDonald's every day. I get my cappuccino back home, and it's probably like a 45-minute walk. Yep. Yeah. It Billy just... loves it. Dog loves it. I love it. And it's, it's uh, like you said, it's non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. I just, you know those days where it's like pissing down rain and you can't go outside? Yep, yep. We're getting a lot of them in Brisbane at the moment. Yeah, and it's not a good time, hey? No. No. No, it does my head just, in. There's definitely something about sunshine and fresh air that is insanely good for you that I think when you start the day that way, I mean, it's proven stuff, but it's a, it's a really good way to start the day. Yeah. Number two? Number two, <laughs> sorry, it's another really boring one. Um, I really, really, <laughs> really need my fruit and veggies in the day mm -hmm. because when I don't, I can tell you this, if I do not get the adequate amount of fruit and veggies in a day, the next day my digestive system is like backed up. Yeah. It is like, nope, we are not cooperating to our feel <laughs> like crap. But this is something because you would be you 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 remind me your body would remind me of a professional fighter. You're so in tune with your body, like this works for me, this doesn't work for me. Like you see, professional fighters when they weight cut, they know exactly what works for them, what exactly doesn't yep. work, and like they change it even a little bit, it can be kilos on the scale. You would I be can so tell if I'm. Like 20 grams under or over in protein, I can tell because it affects my digestive system straight the next day. I can tell. Does um does it's that nice. is um is Chris as into health as as much into health as you are? So that would help. Otherwise, yeah. that would Definitely. maybe be I a. I wouldn't say he's as diligent. <laughs> But his intentions. <laughs> but I think whoever I ended up with had to be that way. Otherwise, how does it even work? But you and Hells would be the same way, right? Like it's the same values, really. Yeah, I mean, you share those same values. It's um, it's also you know, like if if you've got if you're sitting on the couch and one of you is having a plate of vegetables. And the other one's having two cheeseburgers. It's it's not exactly it's it's influence over authority. And to be fair, that has happened over the years. But um, 
the funny thing is when we as a family are all eating well, we all get along better with each other. We all are in better moods. Yeah. It's it's weird and you don't notice it until you're not doing it. Um, Cause like the eating girls well. are in hot. Yeah. Like just how everything affects that. The girls are in um holiday oh, mode 100%. at the moment. Hmm. I mean, the girls are in holiday yeah. mode at the moment and they, um, they're just a little bit all over the shop. So I can't wait for school to start back because we can just get some rhythm and routine back. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, even over Christmas, I mean, I eat well, whether I'm on holidays or it's Christmas, birthday, or whatever, there, there just might be times of the year where there's a little extra here and there, right? Yeah. And that over Christmas, it might have been a few more drinks or a few more higher calorie dense foods. It's not that I, I don't obsess over food at all. It's just a, it's very easy for me to navigate on a daily basis. Well, it's, but it's like we said, you know, it's, for it's, two a, it's my habitual. Skin breaks out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit like we said earlier. It's habitual for you. You um, yeah, this is just this is just how you eat. And I, I actually enjoy it. Like I really get off on knowing I'm giving my body stuff that it thrives on. Like I love that. I love it. And I again, you know, you feel good from it. One day of off eating, and you feel like shit. And you're like, people walk around like this every day. Like they feel shit every day and they don't even know. <laughs> this is normal for people. What um well one question one question I guess I will ask while we're off on this little we'll go off on a semi tangent. Fitness industry wise, you would see a lot of I'm gonna call them influencers, and it's not a vanity thing, but you would see a lot of people that just aren't practicing what they're preaching, are they? No, no. And I mean, not to say, um, not to say it's a reason people get hired, but if people go to you and see the way you look and see the attention you pay to your health and oh, wellness, yeah. I, that sells you. I definitely think so because, like, I genuinely want through my own experiences. I know I can help them. Like, I know that what I do. And what I've helped with other people can help them feel so much better. And I know that there are coaches. I don't know if it I don't know if it's good or bad that they do this, but they've had struggles with, say, body dysmorphia and eating disorders. And yeah. so, hey, oh, I've I've recovered. I'm gonna be a coach now, and I'm gonna now preach nutrition and health, but you can still see those habits kind of shining through with what they post. And I don't know if they realize over a long time. So say, for example, when girls doing competitions show off stuffing their face with food. Yes. But meanwhile, I look like this. All I see is you're promoting binge eating because someone's going to look at you thinking, hey, she's looking great and she's eating five donuts. I can do that yeah. too. And yeah. they're the same coaches you'll see with certain type of clientele. And you know that they've got their struggles and without even realising they're projecting that on the other people and drawing those issues in those people to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it does. And um, one term, I mentioned it earlier, one term I constantly come back on that a mentor of mine uses is influence over authority like there's so yeah. much and like again you start you know you you put up one post of you you know and again it's not that you're worried about what people think but you just you know it's it's what people are watching they're watching what you do right and then they're watching what you do wrong and they pay a lot more attention oh, they're watching everything than what you do wrong so this is why like i said it would be nice every now and then for you just to be a little bit of a, a ghost where you are because you must feel sometimes that like even your clients, like there's all eyes on you, but then it's probably different for you because that's just what you do. You don't have to act that. Yeah. That is what you do. Yeah. 
everything I put out on social media is exactly how it is. It's funny because I'll meet my clients. I'll run these photo shoots a couple of times a year and I get to meet my yeah. clients. It's really cool. And they'll come yeah. around from Australia and all over the place. And I remember one said to me, she's like, someone asked me the other day, oh, what's Tammy like in person? She goes, exactly the same as she is on social media. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fucking dad. That's what I am. <laughs> That's good. It's, you know, and again, this is the reason one, like I was asking you about social media because um, it's something that I know I struggle with, that putting yourself out there on social media, especially in this day and age where I'm sure you've probably had, you know, an experience of trolls over the years. Um, yeah. It's fucking hard it. work. It's really hard work. Like, I don't like being on it, but my job means I have to. Um, Correct. And there's so, I mean, I have to be careful sometimes it doesn't suck me into that dark place. Like, I mean, a couple of weeks ago I even felt the pressure where, you know, I'm 38 now. There are, I remember I used to be one of a handful of female PTs I knew in Brisbane, female PTs yeah. were very rare. Now, yeah. female coaches are like in abundance. Well, they're fucking they're all in their twenties. They all look like fucking supermodels. They're like yeah. these fitness babes, and I'm just over here feeling like 38 and old as fuck. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. Can't say I mean, <laughs> no, but you are like. You're you're an old you're an old woman now as far as the yeah. as far as the industry goes. I mean, I'm I'm 48. I'm rolling in classes. So there's one kid I use as an example when he and he's one of my, you know, top kids. When he was born, I'd already been doing jiu-jitsu for 2 years. And he is a handful and then I'll like get something or show something and I'll go, oh, you see, fucking old man. He's still got fucking something to offer. Um, but yeah, it's the same. This morning I got out of bed and I was fucking hurting because I tried to keep up with these younger guys last night. <laughs> you know, it's really just, confronting. Like, yeah, fucking nice. It sucks. When it, you know, in health and fitness, when age does play an effect on your performance, on the way mm. you look in this industry, I think it is a bit of a hurdle to get through. Um, and it's, it's definitely something I am, you know, I, I will admit I am struggling with it a little bit at times, but I feel like this is where I've got to focus my attention on my people, which are the mums, you know, the women that are a bit older. That's exactly um, they're right. They're my connection, right? Because the good thing that's come of that age that you are is, like you said earlier, you're now attracting a demographic that understands and wants to delve on those experiences. And as you said earlier, you're enjoying working with them probably more because they actually just want the big people. picture. Yeah. I think because there's, you know, younger people, I have had my share of crazies and they're always... <laughs> <laughs> not always, but often they're younger and they just dramatize things. And I'm like, mate, just eat the fucking food. Like you're just, you know, as you get older, your mindset. <laughs> I know it's not that easy for a lot of people, but as it. you get older, just eat the fucking space food. Calms down a little bit. And yeah. so it's easier to work with these people. <laughs> Is there um is there another two things that you can't live without? I think we've only gotten up to the second sunscreen. one. Sunscreen. Yep. I just Townsville sun is out of this world lethal. <laughs> okay. It is. You will get burnt, and I mean red raw burnt at seven a.m. You um. You naturally have a little bit of olive skin about you. Was that even a was that even a um what's the word acclimatizing thing for you moving up to Townsville? 
Yeah, it is so hot here. Like, I actually don't yeah. mind it, but I'm in my cushy little house with aircon. Chris <laughs> works on a tarmac. <laughs> he hates it. <laughs> but um, I just have my lovely olive skin now just has some hardcore tan lines. Like I am forever uh-huh. wearing a pair of invisible white shorts <laughs> on my body. Like the tan lines are irreversible. <laughs> <laughs> have you got a number four my number four okay i you know what i've just i'm gonna stop you there i'm gonna stop you there do you know what i'm noticing every time you go to say something that you think is just a little bit oh i don't know you will go okay and you'll do this you'll go this with your hand okay <laughs> brace yourself for something Carry that's on. not exciting <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> what is it? Okay. Oh, shit. I did it again. Oh, my gosh. Right. So, <laughs> my number four, I cannot live on this planet without a dog. And I don't know if you've ever met Taco. I don't think I formally met Taco. My little my little Frenchie boy. Um, I just – he was my first pet that I had from a puppy. Yeah. From a baby. Right. Yeah. And when, so he, he died last year and that was a pretty, that was a pretty traumatic experience how he passed. And I was like, I can't, you know, I can't have another dog. I don't want to ever replace him. But after two weeks, yeah. the emptiness of that lack of that little soul, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So then I, not to replace Taco, but I, I was like, I need, I need another dog in my life. Like, I want my walk to have a purpose. I want that little needy, very cute thing. I mean, I have a baby now as well. But <laughs> I still, I just, I don't know. There's something about him. I um, I totally agree. Um, I interviewed uh, another person recently, and same thing, dogs. I have had dogs every since I was a baby, there's been a dog in my life. And I think it's interesting. Dogs love you unconditionally. No matter what sort of day you're having, you can come in and have the shits and you can come in and be just a great person and they will still love you. They will still, I don't know if you've seen yeah. um, little, little Lenny, Lenny, our little black Affin pincer that we have. Yeah, he yeah, will I sleep have. on the bed and 4.30 when the alarm go, goes off, he will uh, wake up and he'll be like, oh, we're on, let's play. And I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to fucking wake up. But yes. that's how much love they have. You know, yeah. it's, no, it's awesome. It's awesome. What's the, uh, what's the yeah. new dog's name? Uh, little Ralphie. So he's another Frenchie. And I'll tell you this amazing but horrible experience I had with him. So he's only just past one year old. Um, Taco died two days before my birthday last year. Oh, God. So now I think my birthday, I think of him. This, so not last year, year before. Last year comes my birthday and I go outside and you know what it's like when a dog's not well. They just sit there and their little ears and their face and you're yeah. I was like, what? I'm like this cannot be happening again. <laughs> Over a few hours, he just deteriorated. And what had happened was we find out after 10 days in ICU, oh. he had sepsis from, I don't know what, just had sepsis. And the vet nurses said to me, we, none of us have ever seen a blood count as low as your dog. So his wow. white cells, his red cells, his platelets were at rock bottom. And to the point they asked me, you know, do I want to euthanize him? And I went in twice a day to visit him every morning, every night. You know, it's a 30 minute drive to and from. I'd take Billy with me. And he just, he would lie there. And you could, I'm not even kidding, you could see in his little eyes, he was hanging on literally just for me. Because yep. if that was a human, you they would have just let go because it'd be easier. Yeah. The connection that, 
animals, like we always talk about the connection that we have to animals. There's also the connection that animals have to us. You know, like, and, you know, you, you talk so fondly about, you know, pets that you have, past pets. I think, um, and I think it's important for like Billy as a kid, this is one thing I think probably happened more. Young kids need to be around dogs and need to be around cats or whatever pet um, yeah. and understanding that oh, they are part so of the special. dynamic. I can't wait for Billy to be old enough to like connect with Ralphie because they're almost yeah. the same age. <laughs> It'll be really cute. Well, it was funny because when I um when I was a child, my parents bought a German Shepherd three months before I was born. So up until oh. about two, up until about two, I called that dog my brother. That's my brother. That's my brother <laughs> Nero. So Billy will probably so have that. Shape how you are today? Yeah, <laughs> we kind of look different, but we're related, you know. Um, I Billy, love that. I think Billy will really have special. that connection. You know, I yeah. I guarantee it. Yeah, All right. no, I can't wait. I can't. Wait. <laughs> and animals are so gentle with babies. You don't need to tell them. No. They just, they just they know. know. It's crazy. They know. Number seven. If you were not doing what you are doing in life right now, what would be option number two? Okay. Fuck. <laughs> 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 it's okay, before, man. <laughs> before I got into fitness, um, I 100% believed that my job would be somewhere in the animation film industry. So oh, yes. remember when I did the course in animation, I did a two-year degree yep. in screen and animation. That was – I would have been working at ABC with Helen at that yep. point, I think. Yeah. it was the year later. But anyway. I remember this now, yeah. Yeah. that If I have a gift, it is art in the cutesy, cartoony realm, right? But – that I remember in the second year of that degree, there was a Sydney Disney studio. Yeah, my, my heart was set on it, right? And it closed down, it closed <laughs> down that year because 2D animation was phasing out. Yeah, so you know, 2D like Aladdin, like Snow White. Yep. Then you bring in um, Toy oh, Story, like Toy Story, and everything yeah. from there, everything was turning to 3D. And 2D animation was it had its time, and we did an element in 3D animation, and I hated it. It was it was computer. It was draw mm. lines, connect dots, ninety degrees this geometry. It was stale and horrible. I hated it. Do you um do you draw now every now and then just because you can? You know what? It is something. If you ask, you know how you asked me about guilty pleasures before. That came to my mind, but I just don't do it. I wish I had the time to do. Like, I love life drawing. If there's an opportunity and I could find a life drawing place here in Townsville, which I've looked and I can't find one, I would do that. It is like a form of meditation. It is insane. Yeah. You just get like your laser focus on just the art. Everything else is gone. Did you um? Did you draw a lot as a kid? Yeah. So art, art, art in high school was your thing. Yeah. Anyone I went to school with would think that's what I would have been doing. It's a weird turn from <laughs> art to fitness, but I think in one way, I'm a very visual person. So I'm, I'm, you know, when it comes to learning the science and the hard details of exercise and nutrition, I am much better at hands-on. I can look yeah. at a deadlift and analyze and fix it. Yeah, I can Same. work with a person um, to change their physique. Visually, I can see, you know, when you're bigger this, bigger that, whatever. I'm, I guess maybe it translates to that. It's good. Um, and, again, like you said, you're still sort of, you're not ruling it out because you've been looking around for maybe down the track, pick it up a little Definitely bit. Definitely down the track. I feel I feel I'd be robbing my own life if I didn't. Like if you're good at something, 
and you're not yeah. doing it, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. One time you have backed yourself when everything was saying to just give up. Having a baby. Definitely no. my first competition. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because no one knew what it was. There were no coaches around. I worked full time in an office of people who said stupid things to me like, I quote, why would you want to look like a man? Surrounded, mm. you know, I would take my own lunch to work. Why don't you just buy something? Everyone was so criticized, like criticized everything I did if I ate well or, you know, had this ambition of doing a show. And it just, that sort of behavior drives me in the opposite direction. Like, you know, those people that looked me up and down, I'm like, well, I'll show you. <laughs> Isn't it funny now, like just with bringing your own lunch to work, even that has changed? Like meal prep has become a thing. It's a thing. Like, you know, it's, it's like a, it's, it's, it is a, it is a thing. Like it's, you know, you see on the community pages, people are, you know, wanting to hire someone to come and help them do meal prep. Like it's, yeah. um, it's, it's a good shift to see that people are, you know, like I said, if there's, there is bad things that have come from the fitness industry as any industry, but yeah, I think there is genuinely that shift where people are giving maybe just that more of a shit of what goes into their mouth and that's maybe translating Definitely into cafeterias. Is. Yeah, I would say it's more acceptable to eat out of a container now than it was <laughs> back then. <laughs> um, when you were doing the comp, the first one on your own, things like like posing and all that sort of stuff was – you, were you just going to the University of YouTube or were you like, was there anyone in Brisbane to help you? There was that one person that my friend Vinny, the guy I met at mm. the supplement store, her name's yeah. Joe Rogers and she was an old school bodybuilder. Yeah. And she was the one person who did posing sessions and she lived in Jimboomba. So that was an hour drive to like, each way. Now you've got hundreds of posing coaches. But I was going to say. She's an amazing. Well, that's a very, your posing side of things, that seems to be a very um, in-demand part of, part of your business. Yeah. Posing can make or break. You just like technique in, um, you know, jiu-jitsu, technique will make mm. or break. You could be strongest. You could be the biggest. If you don't have that technique, it doesn't matter. If you're yeah. on stage and you've got the most muscle, if you're not literally contorting your body to create the illusion of that, think of that Arnie, Arnold Schwarzenegger X yeah. shape. Doesn't yeah. matter. Because most, think of it like this most females on stage, they're athletic, they're quite blocky up and down, majority. Mm. You've got mm. to twist and turn and create a lie basically of what your body actually is versus what it really is. <laughs> so someone going into a competition like that, would you say that's the missing link for so many people? And when they turn around and go, yeah. I thought I'd yeah. do better, they didn't do enough on that? 100%. People often leave it last minute, like maybe four, eight weeks from their show. And I think what they don't realise is, it's almost like learning how, like a dance because yeah. you don't have a mirror in front of you when you're on stage posing. It's based completely off feel. And yeah. the other thing is you need really good mobility to say like a thoracic rotation to be able to rotate your waist. And a lot of people don't. So they'll ap approach, you know, four to eight weeks till show day. Like, yeah, I'm so lean. I've got my muscles. But they're so jacked up. They can't twist. They mm. can't, you know, get their lats out. They can't activate their glutes. And that is their downfall on stage because basically they can't show the judges what they need to show them. And that is a big fault from especially the bigger guys I know of, you know, and from a jiu-jitsu point of view, I love arm-locking bigger guys to smaller guys with 
bigger sh- guys with bigger shoulders to smaller shoulders because I've got yeah. to do nothing to get the tap because their mobility in their shoulders is just shit house. You know, oh, it's, and that's it's, most people hate. It's just mm. rubbish. They're useless. <laughs> it's all show. <laughs> okay. Number nine, three pieces of advice you would give to people who are finding reasons to not back themselves, but to instead back themselves. I love this. I thought about it. I wrote it down. One, just go for it. Like, that is it. Just go for it. Why not? Who cares? What does anyone else matter? Like, why yeah. would you let other people be the reason that you can't succeed or find happiness, do stuff that, you know, would bring you joy? Why? Just yeah. go for it. That's do you, question. um, do you sit back and uh, like you just said about art or people at high school assumed you were going to be an artist and now you're doing this? I call this the high school reunion theory. When you go back to a high school reunion and they will go, I just never thought you would be doing this stuff, but you wouldn't be doing it if you just didn't give it a crack, you know, and it just lights a fire, doesn't it? But why do you think people don't do it? Like you'd have clients that if you want them, like they want this something, but they don't want to do this little bit. Why are people afraid to take that jump? It is 100% fear of failure, perfectionism. And that was me my entire life until I did that first show. That first competition was the first thing that I did that I finished that made me realize that work, you know, do the work, get the thing. Being a perfectionist and being afraid of failure, it will make you so unhappy. I think that's most people's block. And I think the, um, well, for what you do and for the, for the competitions that you've done, there's definitely no element of cramming that you can do. Like you've got to be systematically doing this stuff day in, day out. Yeah. That is something that, you know, that dedication, this is, this is going to work. This won't happen straight away, but it's going to happen. Um, yeah. Number... In a prep when I've got clients and they're doing a show, we do 20 weeks and I will say yeah. to them, on average, this is like, <laughs> it's not a technique I use, but this is like fact. You're going to lose, if you do this, we will aim to lose 300 grams a week to get what yeah. you want on stage. You miss a week, you don't get that opportunity back. You don't mm. get what you want. And that's literally what it is. You decide to not follow your meal plan for one week, that's 300, 500 grams off you won't get back. And that's the difference between looking how you need to and how you won't even be looked at. Yeah, yeah. What's uh what's your what's your second one? Second piece of advice. Um, always bring it back to your why. Because if you don't have a good reason to do this thing, I don't know why you're doing it. Like if it's peer pressure, if it's example, social media has a very big influence on people and the way they look. And I know a lot yep. of women do shows because they think it's going to give them more popularity, more money, I don't know, something. They think that body yeah. gives them a better life. That's a shit why. They don't <laughs> even have a why. If you ask them, why do you really want to do this show, they wouldn't even have an answer because how silly is it to say, if I look better, people will respect me more. People will like yeah. me more. I'll have a better job. Like that's a silly answer because everyone knows that's not how it is. If you have a good why, it will motivate you to stick to like to do the thing. The ironic thing is if your why is more in check, you will not popular, but you will get closer to that end goal. Like for you, you are very authentic. You call a spade a spade and you've got more than your share of followers on Instagram, but you're not doing it to get extra followers. That's a byproduct of everything else that's happening. Yeah. And you know what, in the scheme of things, 
I don't have that many followers. Like if you look at other people in the world that I'm in, I feel like just this little small fry. <laughs> but here's the other thing, right? Social media, what sometimes it gets to me where I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not getting the traction? But yep. I will still get so many comments. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's so many people that look at your stuff and they don't click the like button or they don't follow. And again, take take everything out of it, as you would probably agree, referral is always your best your best point of point of business. It's always word of mouth. It's always word of mouth. Always word of mouth. Absolutely. Or you'll have that silent follower. It's been sitting there for five <laughs> years, absorbing everything you say. They don't interact whatsoever. And then they contact you. I've been following you for five years. I feel like it's now my time to work with you. And you're like, holy shit. <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> I've been here all the time. What's number three? Number three, um, do it to prove them wrong. Like it is a, it is, they're, they're just having fuel to the fire. Like if you want this, thing, and this, it could be anything. It could be business related. It could be buying a house. It could be building a family. If there's people that doubt you, just prove them wrong. And usually people only express doubt to you. It's, they, they're jealous or they feel threatened. People, you know, good people yeah. want you to succeed, right? You, um, They'll be there to back you. Anyone else, prove them wrong. You've definitely, like we touched on trolls before, but you've probably had your share of haters or people who have said to you, I think you're making a really bad decision. Do yeah. you shut them out? Do you just try and cut out the noise how do you deal with that um i don't deal with it so much now because i work from home i'm just me <laughs> but <laughs> back then i it got to me a little bit like it got to me where i'm like why would you say something like that it didn't bother me where it made me think i wasn't making a good choice i just wondered why would you say that like that's me why mm. why why mm. um but yeah, I don't get that much at all anymore. It's just me, the dog, and the baby. <laughs> you must, um, <laughs> but that must also be refreshing because now you get to focus on the right things and not the wrong things. You've got that these things in your life that are worth focusing on, not this guy on socials or this guy at oh, the gym who's know, telling you you're doing it. Yeah, you're doing it wrong. There's so many of them. They're just fucking idiots. Like. I don't even know who they are. I just think you have nothing better to do than say something stupid to me. Like, I don't get that much of it, but when I do, I just either block them or I'm like, <laughs> where do you, um, so you're going to, you do CrossFit in Townsville now? Yep. What do you like in a CrossFit class? Are you the guy, are you the person hiding in the back? Um, are you, what do you, how do you do it? <laughs> Um, in a CrossFit class, do you know what? CrossFit is quite challenging for me now because, you know, I used to be good at it. I used to have a body that could do all the stuff and I could do it really well. And now, you know, from the injuries that I've had and then having a baby, I have quite a lot of limitations. So I have to go in there knowing, okay, I can't do this in the class, I have to scale it to this. And my, it's, you know, I walk in there again. It's like I have this little argument in my head. It's the ego. Yeah. And I just have to shut it down. Like, first of all, no one cares. No one knows your background in CrossFit, so they don't give a fuck. People are too busy doing what they're doing. Go in there, go exercise, go mingle with some people. End of story. Because uh, those who don't know, Tammy also went to the CrossFit Games in the teams division. So yeah. that's the reason I asked the question. Your e and, and it was good that you mentioned ego because as we've said, we said before about me with jiu-jitsu, you being 38, that, that's, that was then. Now you're doing it 
for longevity. You're doing it to live longer, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the beauty of Townsville is I don't even think anyone knows what my background is in CrossFit, which is good for me because there's nothing to compare it to. Whereas in Brisbane, CrossFit, like any club, sport, whatever, everyone knows everyone. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't be doing CrossFit in Brisbane because of that. I would just find it too tempting to try and do the stuff I know I shouldn't do because I will hurt myself again. Like mm. I had some pretty I had three tears, bicep, both sides of my traps. Um, and the recovery period then included bursitis in both shoulders. And I think it took two years to recover, mm. but it changed my mobility. Like I can't do overhead squats anymore. And then I had no. a baby. And that just messed up my spine. So I'm very broken. But here in Townsville, <laughs> I, at the box over, I'm just some chick doing some stuff. Like, no one cares. I'd, um, I'd like to tell you it gets better as you get older, but it doesn't. It gets worse. It gets way worse. <laughs> way, way worse. <laughs> I love that. It's so funny. But now we play the card. We can play the card of, well... I'm the really fit old person, which is pretty cool because most yeah. people our age don't even do this. <laughs> I'm the fit old guy. All yeah. right. Number 10, final question. A quote to live by. A quote to live by. I did think long and hard about this because I was like, I don't actually think I have one, but there 100% is one sentence that I've always reverted back to and I always tell my clients probably the last 10 or so years and that is you are your number one because you know people will fight that but my my family my kids my job my boss and I'm like if you're sick you are nothing to them if you you know break a hip you are nothing to them if you're a cranky piece of shit because you had bad sleep you're a bad mum, you're a bad friend, you're shit to work with, you know. If you don't put yourself first in health, in well-being, you are not a good person for anyone else. And when you're a better mum, your kid is your number one, yeah, right? 100%. If you're a better worker, you are that top worker in the office, you know. Um, it's that age-old... Uh... The uh, the uh, oxygen mask falling down in the plane. You put it on yourself first before you put it on anyone else. Do you find um, with your clients, especially like you said, um, older women, mothers, that's the biggest hurdle for them to get past? 100%. And that is actually why a lot of the mums come to me because they have reached a point where the most common thing they'll say is I've lost myself. They have dedicated themselves so much to trying to be a mum, which, you know, it's got the best intention, but they're sick. They're sick as in they're so undernourished, overworked, lack of sleep, pain from not moving, yeah. they're miserable. Yeah. And they just, they've hit that point of I need to make a change and I just, they have that guilt but I'll say to them, look, there is no guilt in looking after yourself to be the best version of yourself. Mm. Well, that's like you said, if they're out of whack, everything's out of whack. And I think um, it's now the direction you've taken with your online stuff, you don't get that you don't know what it's like anymore because we've just spoken for an hour and a half of how you're probably more strict. You're more strict with yourself and your lifestyle than you've probably ever been before because you have a tiny human to be accountable for now. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I, you're right. Like I am more strict with myself than ever before. And at the same time, I'm the happiest I've ever been. Like <laughs> I, it's, it's creating boundaries for you, I think, that yeah. let you – Find the balance 
that you are happy and you are your best for everyone else so everyone's happy. No, I think um, from all I can see, mate, you are, uh, you are hitting the mark. You are hitting the mark. Um, I think fun. you're welcome. I think, uh, I think we'll pull it up there. But look, um, it was interesting when I said how long we've known each other for. So to see, again, I keep saying it, that girl that argued with me about push-ups to now being an incredibly successful online fitness and wellness coach. That's one of those things where you go, I didn't see that coming. So no, I think, but is that not ironic? The well, it's girl fucking that hilarious. Says, Don't make me do push-ups. <laughs> then starts doing bodybuilding. Like, it's, what it's, happened? <laughs> it's fucking. It's I. I will raise. I will talk about that. Maybe once every two or three months, just randomly to someone. I said, I know this girl, <laughs> and there was this time. So yeah, think yourself lucky. You are in um. You are in CMA folklore, you know. As a as to this this is um this is how when you start not worrying about well I guess for you it's you stopped worrying about what people thought or yeah. were going to think or could think and you started focusing on you and now look where you are. Isn't that amazing? Like you could put, literally put that on a shirt. Stop worrying about what people think, and you will find happiness. It is- yeah. As simple as that, but it's very complicated. <laughs> it's not easy. That's why we're. Uh, that's why a lot of us search long and hard for it. But it's because we're so old and wise, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, I've got ten years on you, mate. I got ten years on you. <laughs> oh shit! But, um, yeah. <laughs> Tammy Sarkozy, thank you so much for your time. The um the thank tiny you. human will be waking up soon. I am sure. The tiny human. Oh look, he's. I don't know if you can see that, but he's the little potato that's just lying down in the corner. He's still asleep. Hey, got... he's just like me. He has really good routine. Yeah, well, he's learned from the best. Um, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for coming on board. Um, thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you so much for your experience. And uh, one of these days, I hope to see you and hug it out. When I come to Brisbane, we'll hug it out. And, you know, I just I have to say, and I know I've said it before, but honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I cannot thank you enough for being a part of that fork in the road because that was the starting point. Honestly, it was. It was the starting point. Um, and I, I really don't think I'd be where I am now if I wasn't nudged in that direction. Like you've been an insanely huge influence on my life. I am deeply humbled to have that influence on you. It's um, and uh, it's it's nice. Like you, you'd be the same. It's um, it's nice to know that you just even play the slightest part in somebody's life. So no. The Thank slightest you. part with such a huge impact, huge impact. Thank you for that. You, know, um, you and Helen, I have a world of respect for you. You guys, uh, I would, you know, if you ask for something, I would give it. <laughs> you're, you're always welcome. And um, I think you've done the greater majority on your own, but I'm very uh, chuffed to have planted a seed. So thank you. Oh, hug. Hugs. Hug. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Guys, thank you for listening to this podcast. Um, Tammy's uh, social handles and all that will go up as part of uh, our broadcast so you can um, follow what she does there and check out all the other cool stuff she does. If you like this podcast and others, you can like, listen, share. We're on Spotify, YouTube and all the other things and stuff and there'll be more coming your way. So with that, we are signing off. See you later, big arms. Thanks, guys. (laughs) We will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.